Scott Hebert, welcome back to Suit Up the Podcast. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I love the watermelon tank top. Thank you. For those who are not watching on the YouTubes, it is worth tuning in just to see Scott's incredible shoulders. Yeah. The The gun show. (laughs) Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. I think the thing that pains me is you actually saw this movie before me. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) I got to it early. But uh, uh, yeah, it was definitely a thing. So I uh, just before we dig in too much, first impressions, like when you queued it up and started watching, what were your expectations for this movie? Uh, my expectations were pretty low. Mm-hmm. I was not expecting it to be a great movie. I was hoping that it could be a good movie. Um, I heard that they did a lot of research and stuff, and I was really worried that the ending was not going to land. Um, I was kind of, yeah, I, don't know, I just had some concerns with that they were going to, um, instead of just making a good Indiana Jones film, I was concerned that they were going to try to insert a bunch of uh, political messaging and stuff into it. Mm-hmm. Instead of just making, telling a good story, making it fun, right? Mm-hmm. Um Yeah, I didn't have very high hopes. But with that being said, I was hoping that it would be good. Mm -hmm. Um, I gave it, I tried not to just hate on it. You know what I mean? Um, I think that my big takeaway from it overall is that I was just very uh, apathetic towards it in general. It didn't um, make me care Mm -hmm. either way about the characters, about the story. This was the least, I would say, invested in um an indiana joe's movie um out of the five i would say and that's that was kind of my big thing is that i was i would say i was more apathetic um about it than any of the other ones Mm -hmm. that's kind of yeah what's up i went to see it dressed in full costume and bless the man that was standing behind the ticket counter because he looked at me and you just saw his face bright up and he's like wow he was just smiling gritting from ear to ear pleased that i deigned to come to hit the theater while he was working there and little kids are like look at him is he a cowboy and dads are like no he's indiana jones he's an archaeologist (laughs) That's and fun. then as I was leaving, the dudes like because they have the big Indiana Jones uh plat uh cardboard thing with the red carpet in front of her, people taking photos. Dude at the ticket counter is like, Do you want a photo with the thing? I'm like, thank yeah. you, kind sir. Yes. So that was it. My expectations were that James Mangold is a good director. And I just want this movie to be better than Crystal Skull. And I think I got that overall. It's some right off the bat, the thing I think this movie does is it makes an Indiana Jones film versus with Crystal Skull. We had talked about this. Spielberg and Lucas were like, let's make a 50s B movie with Indiana Jones. Yes. Like, I, so I think that in terms of it being an Indiana Jones film and feeling like an Indiana Jones film, it was that. Not great, but it was fine. Yes, I would say, I I would say um, Crystal Skull and Dial of Destiny are bad, but they're bad in two different ways. Yes. Like, Like, yeah, there was a lot, like, I think, and I actually, like, that I'm thinking about it, because when you asked me to do this, I was thinking about what I thought about it, and like I like like I said, my main thing was apathy. Like I just didn't care about them mm-hmm. at all, about any about basically any of it. Um, I know that you're really accustomed to this, but in the world of pro wrestling, Terrence, um, <laughs> in the world of pro wrestling, basically you can be a good guy or you can be a, a heel, heel or a face. Yeah, heel or a face, right? So, um, but the biggest thing the most destructive thing that you can um be as a performer Mm -hmm. is be someone that people do not care about 
Yeah. You cannot be if you're if you're the bad guy and you come out and everybody's booing you, you think that's bad, but it's not because um they still want to see you because they still want to see good um good triumph over evil basically. But if you come out and people are they don't care either way, that is that's you're not getting back on the show next week basically mm -hmm. because um it's incredibly yeah you cannot be you cannot put yourself in a territory where people do not care and i feel like that's where they got to so this is going to be full of spoilers so from go here on out if you're listening to this and you're going okay well maybe i should or shouldn't watch it know that everything else we say is going to be spoiling the film so there we go this is your warning and now the movie this film i think part of the reason why it feels so apathetic is because they're retreading the same tired beats that a lot of movies that are legacy sequels are starting to do and so instead of it feeling fresh like i'll be curious to see how this movie does in like the historical perspective I don't think it's ever going to be as good as the first three by any stretch. But I do see where this movie could be considered better in the scope of time, just because anything that once you watch it often enough and have nostalgia, you stop paying attention to all the bad details. Like a James Bond movie. The bet worst James Bond movies are still fun to watch because they're a James Bond film. This film as an Indiana Jones movie can still be enjoyable watch as an Indiana Jones film, even though it's not great. Um, so, but first and foremost, let's talk about that opening first, like 25 minutes where they do yeah, the, yeah. the flashback. This felt pure Indiana Jones. This yeah, is the... I, decent, decent. Overall, everybody seems to, every review that I've watched, everybody seems to think that that first 25 minutes, apart from a couple janky things with the dag mm -hmm. this. Um, a couple shots like him running on top of the train. I was going to ask, what did you think of the de-aging bit? Um, the de-aging bit didn't, the de-aging bit did not worry me as much as him flopping around in the top of a bell tower with a rope hanging over his neck. Okay, that, but that worked that, for me. Okay, I'm just telling, I'm just saying yeah. though, that, 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 that suspended my belief mm -hmm. a lot more than the de-aging part of it. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, that I was kind of already like, I was kind of already like, okay, like he's already should be probably dead. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Well, what I loved about that scene is that it felt the most Indiana Jones because it felt serial type. Like, again, yeah. we were talking about a lot of these movies, they're echoing that serial format. The yeah. him hanging there and basically surviving just because the thing breaks is that kind of moment of tension that is in those old serials. And I'm like, good job, guys. But also it feels like the old Indiana Jones films where something like that would happen. Well, that's what I talked about before when we did one of the earlier ones that when I rewatched Raiders, I was like, oh, I don't know if you could do this today because it's too yeah. campy. It's too like silly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I don't well, know, like you were talking about kind of mm -hmm. going back on the nostalgia and stuff. I don't know if I basically tried to watch it as open-minded as I could because I knew that there was going to be some stuff in there mm -hmm. that I needed to just suspend my belief on. You know what I mean? And just be like, okay, this is like a silly adventure. Cartoonish, right? Yeah. Like you said, the the B-movie, the Pulp Fiction, right? That's what it's supposed to be, the serialized adventure. Um, so that, that part didn't kill me. The first 20 minutes I thought were good. It was There was a couple of... Um, when that guy, when Voller got gets hit with that pipe on the edge of the train, uh -huh. like he gets fucking smoked, bro. He, he gets like it's like a doom. Like he like I don't know. I thought he was gonna have a cool scar. Oh, that something. would have been so cool. Yeah, I thought he was gonna have like a big like pipe. Like I don't know. Blowfeld. Yeah, something like he like he. That's how hard he got hit. You know what I mean? If he's not dead, his skull should have been like cracked open and stuff. I thought that's what was gonna happen. I was like, oh, cool. And then um. No, he's just fine. <laughs> so I think that the de-aging, they did the, they got the best chance of making this work. And for me, it, it didn't take me out of the movie because I knew that's what was going to happen. I know that it is, doesn't look perfect all the time, but they do a great job of not showing his face for the first good stretch. I love 
Like, again, we talked about Crystal Skull. Indiana Jones being pulled out of a trunk of a car. What a great start. You should have yes. started there. This movie, Indiana Jones getting dragged through Nazis with a bag over his head and thrown into a chair to be interrogated. What a great start. Like, again, concept-wise, like James Mangold, bless your heart. This is good. I, I, I know there are other writers involved in this movie, but he was the director he's the one I'm going to credit with this movie feeling more Indiana Jones yeah. because apparently he refused. He got offered the movie. They wanted to like shoot in a month. And he's like, the script needs like a year's worth of work. And they went, well, we'll, we'll find someone else. And then they couldn't man is the only one that would touch it. And they said, well, I guess we're waiting a year. So I credit what is good of this movie to the fact that he wanted to take the time to make it better than just yeah. making it. But I, again, I just, I love the, the whole opening sequence here. I think that him talking, you hear like the difference between young looking face, old sounding voice. Oh yeah. That was weird. Which I don't know why they didn't just de-age his voice too, because they can I don't know, but, man. But, um, that but part... I think that they smartly did it where he's not talking much. Like most of, and that's part of that first jag of this movie, I think works because it feels like Raiders where we're not getting a lot of dialogue. Yes, um, totally. And he's killing Nazis and, you know, mm -hmm. they see the bullet hole and all that. It's like, it's a good thing. And like you said, that the uh, Spear of Destiny or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. That's what, is, that, is that what it's called yeah the spear of destiny it's called the spear of longinus in the actual like archaeology thing yeah that's funny. but yeah spear of destiny and what i love is that's they've used that in the comics before where indiana jones actually found it against the nazis so like yeah. there's a way that this fits in canon as i drop the thing i'm playing with uh it fits within canon of indiana jones has been looking for this to preserve history and again, the thing we complained about with Ox, that he's just this rando dude who we don't care about because they have a history, but we don't know anything about it. Yeah. Setting up with uh, Toby Jones, the actor who plays... Um, yeah, I can't remember his name. Yeah, it, it's because he's just not... Uh, Shaw. Basil Shaw. Basil Shaw. They set up the relationship really well in that film. Yeah, where they do have a relationship and it sets up the dial, which again, something I think they did a good job in. So I I'd sent you that one podcast he's, link. Yeah, he's such a dorky character, though. Like mm -hmm. now that I'm thinking back, like he doesn't add anything to the, no. the one of the problems that I have with this movie. Um, I actually watched a review that was really good. And it was basically talking about Helena Shaw, which we'll get to, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But they said that one of the main problems with her being a sidekick type character is that you have to have a sidekick that has um different qualities than yeah. the protagonist than the hero provide and contrast to, yes and you have to allow that that sidekick to express those things like mm -hmm. there's like other than basil being there he doesn't really add a bunch of he's just kind of a goofy like mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But there's nothing. It goes back to the apathy thing, though. I'm trying to wrap it, yeah. like bring it back. But um, he it, there's nothing to make me think like, oh, cool, he's helping Indy. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? There's not there's nothing that he does in the first 25 minutes that makes me think like, neat. No, uh, the one thing. So the only he serves a plot function, which is yeah. he's there to tell us what the dial is and to become yeah. obsessed about the dial. The yeah. But I, the what it didn't bother me that he's incapable because what it does is it gives a contrast to Indiana Jones the badass compared to most archaeologists who are Basil. Right, but I'm just saying that if it was if if it doesn't uh, go anywhere from there, I it it doesn't make me invest in him as a character. Mm -hmm. And then if it's going to set up that I'm supposed to invest in his daughter yep. as a character, like if I was Indiana Jones, I would like um basil shaw but mm -hmm. i would just think he was a fucking dork mm -hmm. right i would just think that i could, probably could have done this a lot better without him wait question has yeah. indiana jones picked archaeology because it's like the cheerleader effect where all of a sudden he's 
the hot he is the hot one and the everyone hot. else is literally the lamest person on earth um in his possibly. profession possibly i think he just likes killing nazis i hate these guys <laughs> um yeah, I, yeah. I guess that's. I guess the thing that bothered me about him was he was just kind of a dork, and um, mm-hmm. I wish that he. It would have been cool to see. Like, I think it would have been. I think it would have worked a little bit better, and it would have got me to invest in Helena's character a little bit more if mm-hmm. I thought that this other guy was someone really cool who like, Indy relied on, mm-hmm. and got supported by, yeah. got helped by, because then, you could expect to see the same things out of his daughter. And then be surprised uh, when you don't. Yes. Or then when she does, then you're like, oh, she's being like her father. This is the same. This is rekindling the relationship that Indiana had with his friend. There's a lot. So let's get into a little bit of this. Helena, the way that like her story is arced is supposed yeah. to be similar to like they contrast it uh, just a hair with Indiana Jones and his dad and his dad's search for the grail becoming a consuming factor in his own life the same way that Helena's father's search to solve the dial consumed part of her life. Yes. But it doesn't quite work. No. They they just it doesn't I heard uh, on one review that I really liked the the idea that really the better way to contrast her is with Belloc. Yeah. Because Why? essentially she's an archaeologist who has fallen from the pure faith and wants to just use it for the money yeah and there's that worked for me like let's get into uh well the problem let's let's finish up the the train sequence that happens we then go to wake up modern day new york or wherever it is i hate this part and also understand at the same time where we start where indiana jones is a sad lonely old man who lives by himself, yeah. doesn't have his wife, and is yelling at the neighbors. Yeah. My right two here. issues with this are specifically it does that thing where it makes the happy ending of the last movie over in this one. And he works at a crummy college instead of like it's Marshall College in um it's called Marshall College in the uh Crystal Skull. And he becomes the associate dean. Yet now he looks like he's working at some kind of funky little Community college. Uh, community college i'm like indy what happened to you the one thing i'll accept and i want your opinion and feedback on especially is is that just a trope that we've overused of sad old man whose life has fallen apart who is a legacy hero or is it that really if you look at most hero stories heroes don't have happy endings by and large Um, well, I think it's definitely true that probably most heroes don't have happy endings if we explored what happened after the fact. But, um, my main issue here is that we just kind of wake up in the middle of it and, um, there's no context as to why he got there. And it's just kind of, I guess, jarring a little bit as a viewer to Mm -hmm. see that. And it's like, okay, he was just like from the last movie, got married. Mutt's there, has the hat, doesn't put it on, whatever, ha ha ha, we're going on adventures, he's old, fine. Mm-hmm. Um, married to Marion, like you said, associate dean or whatever, and then um, we're seeing him do the flashback, great, back to Indiana Jones, and also, and it's just like, boom, saddled man, saddled mm-hmm. drunk man, alone, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Which, that made me laugh, because when, in the theater, when he, like, pours the alcohol in his coffee, People are laughing, and I'm like, no, no, the point is not that this is funny. The point is it's sad and depressing, and we're all laughing at it. Yeah, yeah, that's the worst when you make something and people laugh at the wrong time. Um, you're like, what? Oh, no, that's hard. That's hard. Um, yeah, no, something about it um, seemed, I think something about it seemed, it wasn't like super off, but I was just like, how did we get here? I mean, we'll find out about it later on type of thing, but um it just didn't again it was just one of the things that did not make me invest in the character i think that if he was in his familiar context i would like it better 
So if we were at Marshall College again, if this was the home that we've seen the past four movies. Yeah. Instead, it's a rinky dink apartment in a city and he's working at what looks like a community college. It, it makes me sadder for him on a fundamental level of like, you were an Ivy League professor. And like his students not paying attention to him. Also, this is the other part. Why in Seven Hells is he talking about all of those other things in the class? He's an archaeologist. He's supposed to be teaching archaeology, not history. Like there is a difference between the two. Yeah. And this goes back to in Crystal Skull. I'm not certain that these guys who are writing these movies know what archaeologists do. Yeah, I think that they just gave him the job title and... um his actual role is an adventurer, right? Yeah. That's the problem. That's one of the problems. One of the problems. So he is teaching the class and he makes a comment about Archimedes and the siege of whatever, something Syracuse. historical. And Syracuse, bro. Syracuse. Thank you. And Helena is there playing with a deck of cards. Yeah. And she makes a comment about the dial, etc. We find out that Indiana Jones is retiring. Which again, I, hey, this scene made me laugh. So they give him the stupid clock and then he walks out on the street and there's a bum and he just hands him the clock. Give him the clock. I don't need that shit. I just made, I'm like, this is the, I feel like this is Harrison Ford like coming into his own of just mirroring life and character where he's just, he's done. He does not care oh. anymore. He doesn't care about being Han Solo. Just wants to yeah. die. Let him die. So he has the drink, meets with Helena. Helena, as a character, is going to piss off a lot of people. She does not bother me as much. I don't know why. I just have a higher tolerance for it. But there were some aspects of her character I thought worked and some that just don't. Yeah, I would like to hit on that too because um, I was watching a lot of the reviews and they said that a, the word insufferable came mm -hmm. up in just about every single one. And um, I also did not find that. Mm -hmm. I don't think I liked her, mm -hmm. but I did not find her insufferable. Again, I was just more... I think apathetic is the word I'm going to use yeah. a lot during this, but I was just like, okay. When that, when I heard the, the one review where the guy said basically that the the sidekick needs to have different character traits, I was like, that that works a lot in my head about why I um, didn't like her so much. I think that she doesn't have, I don't mind if she's also an archaeologist, but I want that delineation between their two, because it's not explicit enough Right. where she has a different, Again, going back to the Belloc thing, she has a different version of faith than he does to worship the same thing. Yeah. They're both archaeologists. Her modality is different than his. I want the conflict of what that means to actually come about and do something. Yeah. Whereas instead, you get the feeling she is a character who is constantly putting on a pose. And like, I get why people would find her insufferable. Because she's trying, she's overconfident in that way that people that are compensating for insecurity are overconfident. Yes. And that's fine for the character. The problem is it doesn't come across well on screen. And it doesn't, it just doesn't play very well. Like there, I wish there was, the director had said, this isn't working. Let's try pivoting or give her a moment of vulnerability. Yeah, she's got no, she, has, she has no vulnerabilities. Well, I mean, in the sense of like a character moment where we we see so like they try hinting at it, but they never actually do it where her father's chase for this has basically defined her life and messed her up. Yes. Have something where it is clear. So we see that she is acting overconfident from a state of insecurity. Make that insecurity something that we can believe and care about. Give us a reason to root for this character, that they will overcome the problem that they are internally experiencing. It's causing them to act like an ass. But we don't yeah. get that. Instead, we get her 
being, haha, I'm going to laugh away at my problems and go jolly well good. Yeah. I like that she is a cheat and that she knows how to misdirect, that she's a bit of a con artist. I think that those elements play really well and work within the context of the plot. It's just, again, because the characterization doesn't give you any, doesn't give you enough humanity yeah. to really care about, I feel like it just doesn't quite stick the landing. And why do you, why do you think the writers, why do you think the writers would think that we would care about her? Other than her being Basil Shaw's daughter. Like, because she's a strong, empowered woman. And I'm, audience, please understand, I am just calling out what the text here has in the movie. I like strong female characters in films. Why do I have to actually state that explicitly before criticizing char female characters in movies? Anyway, this film, because she's a strong female character, obviously we're supposed to root for her, is I think what the writers are trying to default. The problem is, again, I don't care who the character is. They have to give me a reason to care. It's the same reason why we had all of those crappy female-led action movies that came out that they were like, oh, obviously we can do less character work because they're strong, empowered women, and that's the reason you're going to see this movie. Yeah, she just has like no vulner, like you said, no vulnerabilities that um, she has no, like she doesn't get over anything. There's she, there's no character arc almost to her. So in, so in theory, the way the character arc is supposed to work, I think, is that she is supposed to recognize Indy's value by the end of it. She is basically, she is using him at the start to get what she wants. Like she uses everyone to get what she wants. She writes him off as a decrepit old man who is incapable of doing anything. And by the end of the movie, uh, use movie in air quotes because this is Disney Plus extended, um, there should have been, at the end, she's supposed to see that he has value in the world today, that he isn't just a decrepit old man, which mirrors then the arc he's supposed to go on, which is he sees that he still has something to contribute in the world. The problem is, that's what you want, and that's poorly executed. Yeah, um, I just that doesn't give her, like it's such a shallow thing to get over to recognize something in somebody else. I guess like she doesn't do any character growth. Like there's nothing inside of her that changes. It seems like mm -hmm. you know you understand what I'm saying though. Yeah. It seems like that there's nothing, there's no, like, I he's not actually like, making different choices by the end of it. No, and I don't know why she, like, um, like at the beginning, well, I mean, we'll get to the end, but at the beginning, she's not listening to him. And mm -hmm. at the end, she's clearly not listening to him either because she punches him out. Okay. Here's the, we'll, we'll get to that scene. I, I, I think we're going to have a good conversation about that scene. Uh, what did you think of Voller? Uh, okay, so Mads Mikkelsen as the Nazi scientist who great. has, I loved him in this movie. Yeah. He he was great. I think that um, overall as a bad guy, there was not, I kind of feel like he didn't do that much. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. But well, I think I think he was underused, basically. Well, yes. That's how I would describe it. But I liked him in theory, mm -hmm. and I liked him. The only thing that basically bothered me about him was him getting domed on that train and nothing um happened to him but i the rest of it i liked i liked that he was like the greasy german that came back to work for the americans uh -huh. uh you know what i mean i like all that like it's a good that's a good storyline there was there was some weird plot things like um you know he's just blowing off the president and stuff like some like stuff like you don't think that you'd be allowed <laughs> to do type of thing if you were like a if you were brought there as like a nazi <laughs> i don't know and he's still doing Nazi things and being racist to the black guy. Like Okay, but that, like... that was a really good scene. And lots of other reviewers have said it, but I'm going to say it again. That was probably the best, one of the best written scenes in the entire movie. Yes. And yeah, of I... course, his then delivery is menacing. Yes. Are you uh... enjoying your victory? Yeah. He just seems, I don't know, there's... 
Uh, yeah, overall, good. I would say overall good. I did enjoy him as the bad guy. But I do agree. I think he's underutilized in the movie. But yeah. that's also because the movie... This is the thing that's just fascinating about movies like this is you're trying to have balance lots of movie parts. And something that you touched on earlier that I think is relevant is it's hard to compare a movie made now with a movie made in 1989. Like it, the original Indiana Jones films, literally you can't make them anymore. There is different movie making technology different rules like down to the fact they did not want to in uh crystal skull they did not want indy harrison ford to use the whip like actually whip because it would be a safety hazard and he was like f you i'm harrison ford and i learned how to use a bullwhip yeah but like it's just it is a different audience expectations film going it just it is a different animal and I think that some of this is that Marvel problem of our villains have gotten so much less to actually do in movies anymore. Yeah. And this film is just a continuation of that. Um, the I like Hawk. He's the big, burly um, Nazi dude. I just dislike that, again, underutilized, I think, by the end. And we'll get to that point. It just feels like a waste. Um, we go from, so they're chasing down. We have the, I hated the New York parade so much. Yeah, so kind of much. I, a, I hate chase sequences to begin with. Like they don't normally work for me. Yes. Normally. And in this, it's even worse because when he gets on the horse, I'm like, John Wick just did this better. Um, and it just it doesn't move the plot like there's no character development from it like we see indiana jones be resourceful that's about it kind of and then there's also like the silly thing where it's like he's clearly getting chased by these guys who are shooting at him and then he gets framed with murder and that storyline goes nowhere it's dropped immediately yeah and he and he also gets framed with murder Guys recognize him off the news, and then he, he's still going to the airport, and Saul is yelling out, like, give him hell, Indiana. <laughs> like, okay, so two yeah. things there. One, I actually enjoyed where in the library or or the, like, storage room, and he knocks over the bookshelves. That's yeah. a practical effect. I liked that. I thought that was cool, and it works as a part of the yeah. story. Like, it, yeah. it's a good action thing, because, again, the hard part with some of this is, you are working with an actor who is your action star who is 81 years old. Yeah. Just so many more limitations. The other thing is I loved seeing John Rice davies as Sala back. And I think that casting where he's now in New York as a taxi cab driver, I 100% can see that that happens. Like it, story-wise, it works. Having yes. him with his grandkids, I think is funny because you see that it's this new generation. But I loved when he drops off Harrison Ford and he's like, they used it in the trailer and you can tell that they wrote it like this is going to be remembered. I miss the um, desert. Yes. I miss the sea. I miss I waking Barry. up in the morning and wondering what bright new adventure will be waiting for us. That's a good line. The problem is Basically, they just brought him in to like give good line delivery, and then it was like, and you have no other use really here for the plot. Um, yeah, you know what else is like really funny that um, okay, so this was in like 1969 when the moon landing was, mm -hmm. and then he's like, he's showing Indy his grandkids or whatever, and he's like, he's like says something about like the Suez Canal crisis, right? And he's like, oh, it's important to teach them history or whatever he says, something like that, and I was like. I'm pretty sure the Suez, like I was like, when was the Suez Canal crisis? You know what I mean? And um, I looked it up and it's like 1956. So then I did the math and I subtracted it. So that would be like something in like 2007 happening now. So that would be like talking to your kids and being like, being like, when was 9-11? And they're like, 2001. And then you're like, oh, good. It's good to teach history to your kid. Like, it's even, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not that long ago in the context of the movie. Like, it's barely even history. Like, it's recent. I was just like, all right. That was uh, cool. <laughs> I thought that was funny. 
that is hilarious yeah really so they have he's chasing after helena who has the dial and she is in she's going to sell it in it's not istanbul it's tangier Tangier, which again you know like i like that we're getting back to indiana jones elements where we're going globe trotting and out of the country no problem with that uh the thing i thought was funny is really like you made the comment about the airplane and he's one for murder i'm like this is how old the setting is supposed to be that you could be wanted for murder and still got an airplane and fly somewhere totally i just think that if you were interrupting a big parade like that they would have someone at the airport <laughs> you know what i mean checking a passport or something but um yeah, we can skip ahead of those things but basically she's having this big thing we meet this little kid the si- a sidekick to a okay. sidekick which i also... hate this kid teddy yeah. the actor does i'm no hate on the actor like i want to make sure we're clear on this as by and large all the actors do exactly what this plot and film is asking of them i hate teddy though the character serves virtually no purpose if you could remove him from the story it would be virtually the exact same and that just this is the thing this is why i thought he's a plot device little boys are annoying and especially they get that age where they can grow just a little hair on their upper lip. They are little punk ass bitches that you need yeah. to just smack down every chance you get. That's so funny. Please don't quote me on this, anyone that's listening. The point being, it's like the worst age to be in the story because he, he's just a, like short round as a kid. Yeah, I know what and you that mean. That works. Yeah, he's like Whereas, uh, he he's he's. You're right. He is old enough that he's lost some of his innocence, but he's not old enough that he could be like a teenage heartthrob type. Like you love him for a different reason type of thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's at the stage where he is completely useless by yeah. and large. And yeah. like, I will say, I thought it was kind of cute that they did the whole, oh, he's learning how to fly a plane. I'm like, okay, you're setting up something later. I get that 100% wasn't a bad idea it's just again the character is i found him more insufferable than helena myself but i again i he just didn't he just did nothing for me mm-hmm. like with short round like you love that guy man he's in that he's in the thing right away he's the car he's right got away. his little the little he's extra got, yeah when he uh, says that when he says to willie or whatever he's like he's like don't talk to him or whatever dr. jones he, yeah dr jones <laughs> um yeah he calls her babe or a doll or something like you know what i mean there's points in time when uh, like you love short round and he like loves indiana jones and um yeah i don't know teddy seems very forgettable very forgettable i think that if i watched a whole bunch of if i didn't watch a whole bunch of reviews i legitimately would have um not known his name Mm -hmm. i i only remembered it because i looked up here now the tuck tuck chase I yeah. enjoyed this. I agree that it is a little long, but, but, but the Tuck Tuck Chase actually, A, it feels like action and it has movement and momentum in a way that the Indiana Jones films do. And it feels more real than any of the chase sequences in, well, except the first one in Crystal Skull. Like, I, I just always think of that end bit um but the i liked it it was a little long what did you think of the tuck tucks um it's good i think indiana jones has like i think that one of the things indiana jones does is goes on multiple vehicles i guess is a a way to put it methods of transportation let's say they use them all so then being in tangier and going around these tight little alleys is good indiana jones knows everything of course he's already been in tangier and he knows all the ways to go right you know what i mean um yeah, that was fine. They threw in the part about Helena's fiance was in there. I was okay. like, what the fuck was that? Random as shit. Doesn't do anything. Just tries to but, make... But it's funny. And it like it doesn't build on the plot. It just gives you like another random enemy to have in the story. And if we're going by Raiders of the Lost Ark cartoon rules, it works. 
I it would work if it works if Helena's the main character. I, I yeah. Like, why do I need a Robin? Why do I need to know about Robins? Like, why do I? If it was a Batman and Robin movie, I don't need funny things to happen to Robin. I want funny things to happen to Batman, and Robin is also there. You know what I mean? That's a good point. Um, that's kind of what I meant when I said that that the conflicting things from mm -hmm. earlier about the sidekick. She is just the same as Indiana Jones. She can read as well as she can translate as well as he can. She knows as much about history as he does. Um, she's fighting the big Nazi guys, the big, the huge guy. She's fighting him just as easily mm. as old India is. Um, so question, do yes. you think, because this is something I've been asking myself. A woman can fight a man? No. Well, no, obviously not. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I, I know weight ratio just it, ha it happens that way. Um, here's, would I have felt different if this was like, not Chris Pratt, because I don't think that he'd work in these movies, but someone like that type of thing where it's the young, let's say, mutt, except good and not played by Shia LaBeouf. If it's like, okay, we have the hot young dude who is going to do all that like heavy lifting in this movie that's Harrison Ford's sidekick. Does that work better? If it's the exact same like concept where it's his dad who went nuts with it. He's Indy's godson. Does that work better? Um, the problem is not with the gender. The problem is with their relationship and mm -hmm. that they're not different enough that they are providing unique solutions to each other to help each other progress through the story mm -hmm. that's the problem if you gave if you if you did it with a the problem is not her gender mm -hmm. at all zero percent the problem is that there's no discrepancy between what she can offer she can just offer all the same things that indiana can do but better and he has not it's not like he's stepping like i told you i watched the last crusade after or whatever recently mm -hmm. And I love the dynamic that... Oh, yeah. It's so good, man. It is. Sean Connery and Harrison Ford. But, like, that's what I wanted to see. Regardless of who the other person was, I wanted to see Indiana Jones step out of the... Like, I'm okay with, like, a couple of, like, I'm too old for this shit type moments. Because mm -hmm. they are whatever old. But then you got to step into the role of... Mentor. Mentor. Mentor, right? Passing that on. And he he... Other than yelling at her he, and saying like my friend died, you know he he doesn't um, he doesn't teach her that much that progresses her as a character. So no, I don't think so. Um, mm -hmm. I think it would have to be a different, completely different. It'd be you'd need dynamic. a completely different character to make it better. Dynamic. You need yes. a different dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's some, I don't think that, that anything wrong with her as a character. Like I said, I didn't find her super insufferable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just don't think she added that much. I think that again, we go back to that believe, care, and invest idea. We need to have something where we give two flying farts about this character, and we really don't. And I think that that's that's a systemic issue in the movie. Getting to like the, the, additionally with that, so we're now at the point where they have they, they're in the Aegean Sea because. I will give it this also. I think they do a good job of having like the little clues that lead them to different places actually work in a yeah. better way than Crystal Skull does. Um, yeah, I would say so. Where again, a globe trotting in it's better. I do as much as we're picking apart this movie, I do think it's a better story than Crystal Skull. And it has a better I think the character dynamic issues between Mutt and Indy are actually slightly similar to the issues between Helena and um, Indy. Not in the sense that Mutt does have different skill sets to like play off Indiana Jones, so it's not like they're the exact same, but he doesn't provide conflict to Indy's character, and neither does Helena. Yes. So the fundamental issue that we get is the same. But they're in the Aegean Sea. This was the thing that uh, we had texted about 
Antonio Banderas shows up and there's nothing to justify him being there is the thing that bothers me. Like he's an old friend. I 100% believe he has an old friend that's a captain. But when you had asked why they didn't bring back uh, Captain Kanga. Katanga. 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 I was like, oh, uh, probably he's dead. No, the actor's still alive. I'm like, oh, what a missed opportunity. Yeah, that would have made me care right away. Again, just goes back to apathy, right? I did. I just didn't um, care. Like, so he dies, but it's like a character I'm not invested in. So I just don't give a fuck, honestly. Mm-hmm. I just don't care. Like when he dies and I have to see Indy getting mad. Like, I feel the same way as Helen did. Like, haha, we got away. That's how I felt, too. You well, know and what I mean? that's ha-ha, we got away. Uh, like Helena's reaction. OK, so with that, I think that her that scene where uh she's prolonging things yes with the nazis i thought that was a good scene it was well written it was fun it showed the it paid off the earlier conversation that she had where she's like i'm forcing you essentially to pick this card and it's a trick so that's a good setup to this then being a payoff for using misdirection i like that what I did not see, I'll be honest, I actually stepped out of the theater to use the bathroom in the scene where Indy's like talking about how Mutt died. So it wasn't until listening to the reviews, watching reviews later, people are like, oh yeah, so Mutt died in Vietnam. I'm like, oh, like the the acting scene that Harrison Ford got, I completely missed. That's funny. It's all right. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's fine. It's just like he tells him, he's like, oh, my son died. That's why I'm so mad. And that's why Marion left. And he's just like, all right, that could have been helpful, like earlier in the movie to know that before I cared. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, a couple of things about the underwater scene. First of all, my one thought was. um, I like the eels. Oh, yeah, that was fun. It was good. Uh, underwater snakes, right? That's mm-hmm. fun. I, that's I cool. thought it was a clever way to use the trope, but different. Totally. Yeah, I had no problem with that. The one thing I did have a problem with was that there was underwater skeletons um, that had been there for like a thousand years that didn't degrade at all or nothing. <laughs> like I was just like, all right, okay, whatever. I guess that's fine. If archaeology, I will also say I like that it's something different. Like again, I like when Indiana Jones is actually an archaeologist. Yeah. And this being an interesting version of again, we're pivoting into a slightly different version of archaeology. And by now we are in the late 60s. So yeah, we about, have the technology to do that. But what about the part where um, she's like, she's in the boat and she's like looking at the dynamite or whatever. And she's like put on her wetsuit. And then she's like, sees this really handsome like Greek guy or whatever. And she like wants to bang him. Right. Okay. So and I. She's like, oh, maybe I'm like. <laughs> like I. I saw in one of the reviews was like, I'm so it's fascinating that Phoebe Waller Bridge is the only one allowed in the Disney world to still be horny. That's funny. Because like it's true in other films too. Uh because I think she plays the robot in solo. And she's so thirsty for Donald Glover. There's just I, I find do find it funny that like she is still all of these other movies, like even Indiana Jones films in general, there's no like, there's there's not a lot of horniness by and large in those movies. Yeah. With the not exception right. of Willie and right. Indy and their argument about who's going to go to the bedroom of the other person. That one, admittedly, there's there. But no, she is, she is. And, and, and in the last crusade when he gets there with the. Oh, that's right. The, the German, pretty much in every the German movie. girl, I. Yeah. She talks in her sleep. Yeah, that's uh, that. That part made me laugh out loud. No, and, but even when, when he, even when he gets there and he, she's like whatever her name is, and he's like, "Hi, Elsa." He, yeah, Elsa. he's like, "Oh, I want to, I want to take you out, or whatever." He's like hitting on her right away, bro. He's like hitting on her right away as soon as she's there. She's like walking. Okay, over the good point yeah. because then I'm also remembering the students who are like. I love oh, yeah, Maybe Indiana Jones really is a horny series, and I've just it my is. childhood brain. But, but this is, but that's what I mean though about that. There's no difference between. I don't have a problem with um, her womanizing mm-hmm. or with her um, having the relationship. But like I said, these are like main character things to be happening, not um, 
Side characters. Indiana Jones things would be happening. Yeah. Um, in the other thing that kind of just bothers me a little bit is there's no reason given for why they cut the one dude's line, but don't cut the others. Like, A, they don't know whose line is whose. They could have just killed Jones and had no idea. Is that their purpose? Like, yeah, again, it just it doesn't, it's not clear as to what's happening other than to show us the spectacle. Yes. Um, again, Mads Mikkelsen, fantastic performance, does his thing. I find it a little, it stretched my credulity just that much more when he is watching as they have escaped through the binoculars. And he's like, they went the other direction. That's not where his, the birthplace is, blah, 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 blah. He, they're going to Italy. Or I can't remember where they end up going. Point being, it just, it, it stretched Michael Julie. I did like that he set the thing on fire. He figured out what it was. Like, again, this is a scene where we clearly see Indiana Jones is the better archaeologist. But again, yeah. it's like levels of archaeologist. So it doesn't can, mean much. She can translate that. She can translate that whole, whole thing right away super easily. But no so problem. can he. Yeah, but just she just like straight reads it. Like it doesn't have to like all the grammatic. It all works, you know. All the grammar works the same. That's like, movie like, magic, right? though. I know. I I know. I, I just like shitting on the movie. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah, they blow up the. Bo- they kind of blow up the boat, and then, like you said, they know where the guys are going, even though they drove away, and the boat still works. And it's just like, all right, whatever. I can live. Like uh, it's movie overall. stuff. Yeah, I can live with it. They go to Sicily. That's where it is. And they go to the Ear of Dionysus Cavern, which can I just, I really thought that was cool. Like that location. But before that, doesn't Teddy gets kidnapped? Yeah. Which again, doesn't matter. Clear, literally, as we are watching Helena and Indy try to speed away, which by the way, she also wanted to bang Italian dudes when she was there too. I'm pretty certain she was ready to leave Indiana Jones behind. Um, it what's his face? Teddy walks away, and like crappy American tourists, he meets them, and he's like, "I'll show you." Again, preteen boys, just crappy, crappy stage of life. Yeah. And then he gets kidnapped, and Helena and India are like, "Oh, he's been kidnapped." Really, the up. best thing we can do is go finish the thing because they won't hurt him. And I'm like, even though, they killed, even though they killed a bunch of ladies in the library, like they don't, the characters don't care about him. We don't either. No. Yeah, it's a uh, I don't know, very pathetic. Like but said. the ear of Dionysus Cavern, I thought that was a really cool set. It was a really cool sequence going through it. They have to find where the thing is indiana jones figures out the puzzles in there uh helena starts freaking out um the one thing that i'm always when i watch this film i'm struggling to understand is how much of archaeology does bowler understand like clearly he's smart he's a physicist he helped make the planes work i mean the the rockets to go to the moon the problem is like when he gets to the ear cavern of dionysus he's having to try to figure it out it would be more interesting if they had Helena and Helena was being forced to solve the puzzles with him yeah. and try to get ahead of Indiana Jones. Yeah, that would work. That would probably work better. But it's not what happened, Brad. That's not what happened. So they find Di- Archimedes' tomb, the second half of the dial, which again, like, I want to get a. We talked about this before, like, which of the relics could you have? I think it would be cool to have like a copy of the dial. Yeah. It just looks interesting. Uh, they find the wristwatch on him, on his skeletal arm. Voler appears. This is, Teddy has, was tied with a wrist cuff, uh, with a handcuff to the big Nazi dude. Yeah. And then they're like in the water and then Teddy escapes and ties him to the That's thing. Fucking great, bro. Can I just say, I was like, this is really dark for an Indiana Jones movie, and it has oh, yeah. fate-smelting Nazis, and this dude is literally left down there to drown. 
Um, I will say though, it is at least a conceivable way that a small person could take care of a bigger person. It is, but like I think Teddy is a sociopath. Um, yeah. Again, I just didn't. I don't care if he dies. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I don't need to have him. Um, make I was that... hoping Teddy would have a a um, a tragic death that inspires the characters. Fridge Teddy hashtag Fridge Teddy cut sad they get to the airfield and this is the part that i didn't like very much is helena chasing after him on the motorcycle and then teddy is going for the plane because it just feels all redundant yeah like you did not need multiple things happening you could have had two things happening i understand you need conflict but again there there's enough conflict already there in that scene yeah, I kind of feel like that. This is the whole point where we find out why we have Teddy in the story, right? Um, well, so he can fly back or whatever, so he can fly in. They had another pilot there. Like I would have bought if Helen knew how to fly a plane. Yeah, just establish that, and then you don't need this extra person. Like I felt, I think the idea had been if we give her her own short round, it will then humanize her more. But it really didn't. Yeah, I think they. I think the main problem is that they tried to make two heroes in the story, yeah. instead of um, a hero, a sidekick, meaning the sidekick being the kid, and then a damsel in distress mm-hmm. type character, yeah. right? Um, she has a lot of agency. Like you know how I said at the beginning that Bas- Basil is kind of like the damsel in distress almost. Yeah, but a lot of you know what I mean because he's like useless in the sense that he's just got to get saved. He's like Willie him. Scott. Yeah, but it doesn't make him like a redeemable. Um, it doesn't make me care about him in the same way. And I didn't <laughs> care about Willie either. <laughs> I'm like, oh, she's annoying, bro. Willie, uh, by the end, I'm de- I'm like, one day we'll also watch. Uh, Temple of Doom and do an episode together on it so we can complete like our complete Indiana Jones series. Okay. But there is I find it hilarious watching that movie again how it literally goes from Indiana Jones thinks she's the most annoying person on earth and then he's like but I think I can bang you anyway. Yeah. I can see past this. I know a good way to shut you up. (laughs) Pretty much. That is almost literally his attitude. Ah, for the days of good old Hollywood. And in this movie, we so they're on the plane. I do like the fact that, oh no, Fuller's plan isn't to go kill Eisenhower. It's to kill Hitler because he can do what Hitler couldn't. Yeah, I think that there's definitely some um, issues with that. But I overall, I like the, I like that idea. Mm-hmm. It's a fun idea. It's, it's a, a fun bad- idea because it's a twist yeah. on the concept. Totally. Yeah, it's not bad. It's totally not bad at all. And I, I like, obviously, different stuff's going to happen afterwards. So, like, how could he, like, you know what I mean? You go back, kill Hitler. Obviously, it's a whole different timeline. Um, So, I don't know how a smart person like that would think that he's just going to have all the answers. It speaks to his hubris that he thinks that he can do that. Totally. but And that's what I like about the character. It would, I I think I would like it better if he was, like, going to take back clans to make the bomb or something. Oh, that would be better because he's a physicist now working with the US. Yeah, because he's like got because he's got like because he knows what to do. You know what I mean? He knows that would have put more tension to the story. Yeah. If he's carrying around plans for the atom bomb, yeah. It just it gives more more it ups the stakes better than we actually get. So Indy tries telling him that continental drift is a thing and Archimedes' calculations are off. So, like, the whole premise can of the I, dial is yeah, that can I, it can find rifts in time. Right. The, the continental drift line really bugged me a lot. Um, do you know what continental drift is? Uh, uh, no. Like, do, you know what, do, you know, do you know what tectonic plates are? They're the shifting plates in the Earth, right? Yeah, that's correct. So there's a bunch of plates that are moving around. But when mm-hmm. we say moving around, then geologically, things happen over a very, very, very long time span. Okay? So, theoretically, if I built a time machine and I put it right where my house is... It's 
gonna be a different spot. Find the clock. Yeah, it's gonna be a different spot on the globe if mm -hmm. it was like sixty-five million years ago or four hundred million years ago. Yeah, because of these tectonic plates, which are only moving centimeters a year. Okay. So the problem, though, is that um, the Archimedes thing was like 2,000 years ago. So um, the, the drift of the plates would have only been like 62 meters or something. Oh. I did the I did the math for it because I was interested in seeing. I was like, what's the average rate of like continental drift? It's like a couple centimeters a year. And then I times it out by like 2,500, which was more than generous to get back to that Syracuse time. I think it was over by like 300 years or something like that. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was like, it was like a couple of football fields in length. You know what I mean? So it didn't make any sense to me why, um, unless I'm completely misunderstanding. Something. So I assumed that the whole continental drift was him just trying to mess with a volar. Yeah. No, I think that he was trying to like, I think that he was trying to be like, this is why it's not like. It's not going to work because you know, of. Yeah, because the volar then was like, oh yeah, of course the continental drift. You know what I mean? I The way I thought that scene played out is that Indy's messing with him and Voller is like, by did the math, Connell Drift doesn't matter because it isn't significant enough to make a difference. And then Indy's trying to psych him out. That's the way I read the scene, but regardless, I think that it's kind of unnecessary and stupid because... It, this is where the movie breaks down for me, fundamentally, because I don't want to actually have time travel. This is where the movie loses me in every way, shape, and form, because the moment we get through the rift and we see the ships, and even worse, we see Archimedes and his people, I feel like we're now watching a very bad um, sword and sandal film that isn't being particularly historically accurate and looks kind of rinky dink. Like it looks, it just, it looks fake. It looks fake. It looks so fake and it's so annoying how clean it is. Like that time period, everything's disgusting. Everything's dirty. They're literally walking on streets that they pour crap onto the streets. So what? It just, it did not work for me at all. But that said, I think that the idea of, of course, the the people are going to assume that the giant um, plane, that's the word I'm looking for, is a dragon. And them shooting at it and the Nazis going nuts. I think that that's fine and cool. The problem is I also feel like Voller's death is completely unremarkable. Yeah, he also dies at the hands of his own stupidity. Mm -hmm. But it, it's not, it's not cinematic. And like again, this is me complaining. But all of the other villains in the Indiana Jones series, even in Crystal Skull, Spocko gets what she wants, and her like face blows up. I want something like that for Voler, where like let's say they land and he gets killed, rather than just dying in a plane accident. It, it's not horrific enough. There's no... I heard a couple of reviewers put it this way. The Indiana Jones franchise actually has a horror element that is just completely un absent in this film. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the, the ending um, didn't land for me at no all. No pun intended? Uh-huh. No, it didn't... Uh, dude, I was kind of over it. I didn't like that I didn't like that sh she got to chose Indy's thing at the end. Um, so here's what I found hilarious about that. A, so I went back and reread one of the Indiana Jones paperbacks. And mm -hmm. in hindsight, I'm like, okay, really? Like they emphasized in that Indiana Jones's love of history so much more than I think the films do. But it makes sense where the character is just like, wow, this is history. I am in history. On the flip side, I also think that it's completely stupid for him to stay behind because I, so Siege of Syracuse, like in another 
less than two years, basically, the Greeks come back or whoever it was that attacked them and destroy Syracuse, like literally burn the thing to the ground. If Indiana Jones does not die because of his wounds, he'll die in like two years because of this attack. And it just, it's, I think that that's more tragic and we don't need to add more tragedy to this. Like, yes, his decision, sure, whatever. It's a stupid one. I don't know. He's already shot and dying. He's got nothing left. His wife left him. His son's dead. Yeah. His goddaughter's a bitch. <laughs> like, um, I don't know. I, they're just, they're, uh, we don't see a lot in that's happening in New York for him to go back to, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't feel like the connection that he made with Helena is enough to no. bring well, back. Well, I don't, I don't feel like... I don't necessarily disagree with him particularly. I don't. I didn't... That's not how... Like, I just didn't feel... I didn't feel like that was a great well, reaction. We don't see a reason for him to come back. And I think that that's part of the problem. Is, like, realistically, you have to balance out he doesn't have a reason, but we also need to justify why he does go back. But I enjoyed shot, the meta. He's also shot and dying as well. Yes. He's also dying. Like, I he do might not make love, it a couple of days, right? Just I let do him die love the him. Like, he, Indiana Jones, Harrison Ford looks like he has been shot and is, like, experiencing shock. And just like, no, no, leave me behind. I'll be fine. Let me die. I'm dying. There's nothing, no point. He kind of has that crazy look in his eyes. Oh, yeah. And I, I thought it was good acting. Yeah, I did too. I enjoyed the meta narrative of this, of strong, empowered, modern woman is having to tell crotchety old white dude why he's still relevant in today's day and age. Yeah, It made me laugh. A lot. It is what it is at this point in the movie. And then we, I will also say, I like that we didn't prolong it, though. We just knock him out and bring him back. Which, again, yeah. doesn't bother me because it feels cartoonish and like the... Um... Also, I love the Italian dude who is in the airplane that Teddy stole. Fav One of my favorite characters in the entire movie. Just him all of a sudden going, WTF. What is happening? I just had a nap. Bro. Yeah, that's really funny. Wakes up and some kid has stolen his plane and now he is in ancient Italy. He's driving oh, through a butthole in the sky. He's just flying it. What a reverse of like the sky beam. Is it just a hole in the sky? <laughs> so we're back then in New York. I did like I did like Marion coming back. It it was sappy. It was saccharine. Sentimental, but it worked for me. Even um, down to the callbacks of where does it hurt? Like it, it just, it that part worked for me. I loved him playing with the magnet and moving it off of her face after he had put it over her face on the photo when um, she's there. I, I, I um, really didn't like that, that part with Marion at the end. I, I know that we had talked about this before, but um, yeah, I really didn't like the part with Marion. It did not land for me at all. I was just like, what the fuck? That's how I felt. I was like, what the fuck? Where did this come from? Mm -hmm. I was like, how did he get? I was like, how did I, I? I like the jump. She punched him in the face. He wakes up back in New York. Fine with that. But then all of a sudden, Marion's there. I was like, what the fuck? Like, what? How did that relationship get reconciled? His son's still dead. Mm -hmm. There, there are issues. But that's honestly part of my thing. Like, I accept the movie as it is for that. But like there was definitely a strong part of me watching it going, yeah, I, one of them has to die soon or they will definitely get divorced. Because if they are going to keep having issues, they're just going to keep having issues. Like fundamentally, nothing has changed about either of them. Nothing changed about them. So about them. this is where, again, I think that there needs to have been a stronger character arc for Indy. So you I know would what? think it would have been you know more what? interesting to start with hey, him you know what? and Marion. No, you you missed you missed the part you missed the part where um the son died. So you didn't know why they were broken well, up. I got the I did I did know that But not when the movie hit. Yeah, not when the movie hit. Because I did know that. You know what I mean? 
Mm-hmm. All right. Maybe that's why it didn't land for me because if it was just like, oh, we we just had reconcilable irreconcilable differences or whatever. That- so I had assumed that he was dead because I saw the photo. Yeah. I just didn't know that. I just went, oh, Mutt's in the Marines. This is Vietnam. He's definitely dead. Yeah. But I didn't know that that was the cause of their relationship falling apart. I just assumed it was everything that went happened. Do you know what film did this and did it well, in my opinion? Have you seen Fool's Gold? No. Matthew McConaughey, K. Hudson. It's not a spectacular film, but film opens. It's a treasure hunt movie. Film opens with McConaughey and Kate Hudson basically getting divorced and him yeah. trying to make things work. Yeah. Obviously we get character interaction between the two of them throughout the entire movie, but it then by the end, they both have changed as people and try to make it work again. Yeah. This case, it would have been more interesting to have it start where the two of them have broken up and there's a reason. And then Indy's course of character through the story is to, come back because we we don't see that a meaningful version of him being tuned out to him tuning back in which is what they're trying to tell us is the difference i know but the only thing that gets me i think the reason why i didn't land is because the reason i think that i'm supposed to believe that marion's back is because of helena Mm -hmm. well i i claim sala had more involvement but yes um i just think it was yeah just from my perspective i guess that's what i just assumed and i was just like so she fucking saves the whole movie does everything and then also brings them back together they that like how do you i don't know i don't know how you get over that it just bothered me a lot um there was supposed to be apparently one of the original endings was that um indy stays back in time and helena comes back and she gets his hat and becomes the indiana jones do you think that would have worked better or different or (laughs) i think that so this film had i think an impossible task quite honestly i don't think that you can i am becoming more and more convinced you can't make an indiana jones film today within the constraints that they were trying to make it yes uh in part because the times have significantly changed two i think that there is no version of spinning this franchise off other than a complete reboot i think that if they ended it with her with here's the reason i get really when i hear lots of people complaining about oh he should have been left in the past you can't people cannot tell me they would not be complaining if he was left in the past too and that it's just them writing off the character and now we've got this strong female lead because that's, I think, the narrative that would have been if they had done it that way. I think there's no winning. Would you have been okay with a female Indiana Jones? I would be okay with new original character. Yeah, well, yeah, I meant, yeah, I didn't mean like original, like, yeah, that's what I mean. Would Replacing okay? Indiana Jones, I think that I'd struggle if they went, like, so Creed, I think, is the best version of having taken franchise a new story based on franchise. Yeah. Where it's um, Rocky to Michael B. Jo- it's Stallone to Michael B. Jordan. I think that that is the best version that I've ever seen of that. I don't think that works for Indiana Jones. And my, here's my reasoning. I'm not interested in seeing Helena's adventures. And I'm not interested in seeing anyone's adventures really in 69. Like, I just don't think that, I think that we've run out of I think that an adventurer can work. It's just not in the framework of an Indiana Jones universe. Yeah. That's, I think, my issue at this point. I am would love to have, like, I like Laura Croft movies. As bad as they are, I think that they're fun. So I would be happy with a female adventurer. It's just, I don't think it works in this world because I don't think anyone other than Indiana Jones works in this world. Yeah, it's interesting. Do you, yeah, what do you think? Do you think that there could have what do you think that there could be a soft reboot with a new character? We're not calling Indiana Jones anymore. It's called Mutt Williams or whatever the character happens to be. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I do. I think it could be different. Um, I think it could be 
a man. I think it could be a woman. I think that could be a dog. Could be a dog. Yeah, for sure. No, the wishbone it, uh, version. It, uh, yeah, I could see a different thing rebooting it again. But um, same type of thing. It's that it's that time frame of when it was. Um, I think that you need to try to take out as much of the political agenda as you can out of it and just make a good movie. See, and stick to story, 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 man. That's why, like, I, the version of this that, they talked about, I think prequel is the only way to go. Like Ravenwood was supposed to be a Disney plus show, which showed the mentor to Indiana Jones. I actually think that would be fascinating. The problem I have with it fundamentally is that it would have been 1910s, 1920s, and there's no way they'd make it in a way that worked because it would be filmed with modern views. And again, Oppenheimer, so let we can transition talking Oppenheimer a little bit. Folks, you didn't know that today's episode was going to also be Oppenheimer. One of the things I loved about the film is that it feels like it's that time. It doesn't feel like, oh, we're checking all of our diversity boxes to make this movie work. It, I They cast characters that were like the people actually on the studio, not in studio, but in Project Manhattan. Yeah, deeply flawed. Like, um, deeply it- flawed. Um, yeah. They weren't being politically correct. Like, oh my goodness, I, the the chauvinism that Oppenheimer shows on multiple occasions. I'm like, they made this. Oh yeah. But I don't. And Indiana Jones obviously doesn't have that as a franchise, where it needs to be this hard historical thing. But again. I want people wearing clothes from the 1920s and 1910s. I want it to seem like that world. I want them going to other countries and it looking like those countries, not Disney Plus show where everything feels clean and nice. And it just, I don't think it would have worked. I don't think that, I don't think anyone's going to make anything like that right now. The closest thing we've gotten is the mummy. Yeah. To having that kind of Indiana Jones' feel. Before we transition to talking entirely Oppenheimer, where do you rank Dial of Destiny in your Indiana Jones movies? Um, Four or five. Could be last. I'm Mm -hmm. not quite sure yet. I need to let the dust settle out, I think, because um, it was... Like I said, I didn't care about it. And I think that that's even worse, possibly, than um, disliking it, disliking parts of it. I think that the so I heard uh, someone make the comment that your opinion on a movie really comes down to where do, do the high highs outweigh the low lows? For me, the highs of this film with that opening sequence are enough to make it better, in my opinion than Crystal Skull. I think that it has a lot of things that don't work, as our conversation has clearly shown. But I think that inherently, it is a better Indiana Jones movie than Crystal Skull. Yeah. That's fair. Again, but it's still not the trilogy. It's still not it's, reaching it's, it's the a different. It's a different type of bad. It's like, which are you picking? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Which, one, which type... Which type did you not like as much, basically? But I still enjoyed my experience at the theater. I liked watching the film. I'll watch it again at some point. Will I rewatch it on multiple occasions? Probably not. Would Teenage T enjoy this? Probably, because it's nothing but noise on screen and Harrison Ford being Harrison Ford. Yeah, great. So Oppenheimer. Yeah. What did you think? Uh, Amazing piece of cinema. Amazing piece of art. Probably the best... I don't know if it's the best movie I've ever seen, but it's probably easily the best biopic I've ever seen. I, I would agree. On there. I would say it's one of the better movies I've ever seen. I need to let the dust settle on it a little bit. You have to uh, let the mushroom cloud settle. Yes. It yeah, let the radiation fall out. Um it was incredible performances by uh that guy, Killian Murphy. Robert Downey Jr. was fucking awesome. I um, hope he gets an Oscar nod for it. Whatever the fucking astronaut guy, Mark Watley, <laughs> Matt Damon. Oh, Matt Damon. Yeah. He was really he fun did, in the movie. 
Oh, he is great. He, people were laughing in the theater I was at. Um, uh, that you know, whatever Freddie Mercury comes and saves the day, right? Me, um, yeah. Uh, that guy from Josh and Drake was there. <laughs> like, whatever. Josh Peck. Um, yeah, he he was the one, one in this movie who recognized from something. Yeah, bro. I was it's just like, cool. oh, is Josh and Drake is going to press the button. And then I'm like, oh, man, Freddie Mercury is just saving the day. Um, uh, no, inc- like really, um, the I went and saw it in the big IMAX and mm-hmm. um, it was just so big. It filled up your whole view. I couldn't believe how much the um, the pacing of it was just like, Boom, mm-hmm. boom, 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 yep. boom, boom, boom. Especially the first two hours. The last hour after the bomb drop, I kind of felt like um a bit slower because mm-hmm. I was just trying to figure out more what was going on. Well, and the hard part is that third, that last hour, yes. that's also when he starts twisting the information. Yes. Where we're starting to get the twists, the cuts are getting slightly quicker but it's taking a little bit more to process because we're trying to absorb that what we expected is now being subverted. Yeah. I need to, that's what I mean. I need to watch it again before I make any like decisions on it, but it's definitely like a, it's the best piece of cinema that I've seen in a very, very long time, maybe years. Um, I think the sound design was amazing because again, the, the hint earlier on in that film uh, with, um, Kenneth Branagh's character says it doesn't matter if you do the math as long as you can hear it the same way with the music can the you music. hear the math and then we it, that arc carries through where we're really understanding it uses musical cue then to show more of how Oppenheimer's brain is going and where he's at and they do a phenomenal job like all the little all the raindrops in the puddles mm-hmm. with the ripples going out, like the fucking bombs exploding. And um bro, when the when the fucking bomb dropped and then there's no sound except them breathing, and uh-huh. you're like taking it in like like the bomb going off is not the thing. It's like their reaction to it is the thing. It's like beautiful. It's fucking beautiful. And, um yeah, I don't know. I was very surprised that I was there for, especially for the first two hours. There were some times when I was like, when I would like have a conscious moment after like 15, I would have 15 minutes. I was just watching the movie and then I'd have a conscious moment of, oh, I haven't thought about anything other than this movie for the last 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I've seen someone go to the bathroom during it and I was like, bro, how can you fucking go to the bathroom during this? That's what I was thinking. You know what it, I mean? This is um, one of the most visceral theater experiences I've ever had. And I did I didn't get have the big IMAX. I just had regular IMAX. But I did get to see it on the IMAX and it was just I think that the the mushroom cloud and the pillar of fire just going from the bottom to the top, it was breathtaking. Yeah, there was some, I don't know, there was, there was lots of, there was, there's basically a whole hour of shit to unpack from that movie, but um, yeah, I thought it was, it was like a great piece of art, it was a great piece of cinema, Um, when I was walking out, someone was explaining it to someone else, and they're like, I think the best way to describe that is it was like a really big movie, and I was like, oh, that's a good way to put that, big themes, big everything, it was the, it made the point we were talking about earlier before we started, but it made the point that Crystal Skull wanted to make, Mm-hmm um about nuclear power and the powers that we hold and that we need to be like cautious of it but it made it so much better and like i was wondering how they're going to stick the landing and then he fucking sticks the landing and meaning the end and then they did it and i was like oh fuck perfect bro perfect like jesus and i was just like i walked out i had fucking the goosebumps on my arms and shit um I don't know I drove it was like an hour drive home basically and um yeah I know I still think about it this morning I'll be thinking about it all day it was a uh, it was really amazing piece of artwork basically the it really does I think that we don't appreciate how much that atom splitting split time 
in a lot of ways. Technology, science, warfare, the world itself has a delineation. And I loved the, the hint at the beginning towards Prometheus stealing fire from the gods, because I think that it's such a beautiful illustration then for Oppenheimer's arc. How much of the film do you think uh, Christopher Nolan is... Do you think that he is using any of Oppenheimer's story to comment on his own career as a director? Um, I think that a good piece of art works on multiple levels of analysis just by virtue of it being... A good piece of art. A good piece of art, yeah. So um, that, that film is deep enough. That film is deep enough that I think that they told the story of Oppenheimer, but I think that there's a, a lot of different ways that you could look at that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, you could look at it like, like, I don't know, is Oppenheimer even a fucking hero? That's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. He's like a deeply, incredibly flawed person. You don't know if he's good or bad. It doesn't even make the comment. It doesn't even make the comment if he is good or bad. Clearly, he's clearly he's a security risk. In right? fact, the film even calls out the fact that he isn't choosing at one point. Uh, is it Teller, I think, was like, you're saying this, you're saying that. The You can't have it both ways. And yet, throughout the film, he is trying to have his cake and eat it, too. He is a flawed person, but he has so much dimension. He's a very complex character like we i read these books on how to design characters the whole idea is design a character that is full of contradictions because it's in contradictions that we find meaning yes and you can almost even compare that to the paradoxes that they talk about is light both a wave and a particle well it is both but how can it be both the character of oppenheimer is full of that depth And again, the performances are spot on. I I was really glad that Elizabeth, Emily Blunt, that's the name, Emily Blunt, got room to act towards the end. Because that first half of the movie, I'm like, why did we cast Emily Blunt in this completely thankless role? But then we get to that midpoint and she starts having a more aggressive. Oh, bro, when she's in that interrogation. Oh, fucking... fantastic. Yeah, so good. So good when she's in there. Fucking Jesus. And then when I... When, when he's when that other lady's on there and they're having sex or whatever, Lawrence Pugh. Ooh, ooh. Right, is that who it is? Sure, Lawrence Pugh is the name of the actress. Yeah, that's the girl from Midsummer. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, man, it was so good, so good. I I loved it. Um, I like I said, I definitely got to watch it again. Um, I think that this is Nolan's you know, best movie. You know who Richard Feynman is? Richard Feynman was a physicist, wasn't he? That worked with. Yeah. Oppenheimer yeah there's a book called there's a book called like uh surely you're joking Mr. Feynman that I really like it's just a book about his life or whatever but uh okay. he plays the bongos oh so he's the one that played the bongos in the movie yeah. Yeah. I was he, like he, wow that's I'm why, like that's why he was there because he was in the Christmas party and then he's after playing on there too that's who that was so there's probably a whole bunch of there's probably a whole bunch of little things like I don't really know that much I know a little bit you know what I mean um, but there's probably a whole bunch of shit like that where I like that Jack Quaid was cast as him. Yeah. Okay, so this is what I loved about this movie. Every detail I feel like has to be based in something in a way I usually don't with biopics. Like yeah. normally I'm like, oh, biopics, all they're doing is they're taking basic character name yeah. and then making it something yeah. else. They did this thing, but we're gonna make it cinematic. I feel like this movie has ev they took the story and made it cinematic rather than making the story cinematic. If that makes sense. Yeah. It, they just translated it to film beautifully and adjusted the placement of events to make it more cinematic rather than change the story itself. 
Yeah, um, I don't know the history good enough to say how close it is to the history, but it's a fucking really good movie. Um, overall, there was like, yeah, I only had like, there was only one, there was only one little tiny scene, one shot that I didn't like. Ooh, which was it? Um, he climbed up to the top of the tower when it was really oh, windy. Yes. And the wind noises were blowing around, but his suit wasn't moving or anything. And none of the mm-hmm. little cords was moving. And I was just like, oh, that kind of like, I didn't like those. Yeah. Ha. Huh. But because it, it, I don't know. I was just like, I don't, I didn't, that was the only thing where I had like a little bit of like, I'm like, oh, why was that in there? You know what I mean? Why is that? Why is these noises here? I'm like, is this supposed to be a flashback? That was all my cognitive dissonance. Like mm-hmm. I said, the rest I was just like totally immersed in it. There was one point where he, um, there was one point where he is going to teach theoretical physics, and his one student, like literally one student, walks in to the room, and then he goes to the board, and I was like, bro, they better turn around, and there's going to be a whole class there, and he turns around, there's like five people I was like, yeah yeah fucking Chris Riddle yes I was like that's such good pacing it was just it's just like there was so much that just breezed through that story like I couldn't believe the pacing in the first uh, especially the first two hours there's that scene I loved it where he's explaining to Matt Damon what they're going to need and he starts explaining it in the classroom and it literally seamlessly transitions to on the plane and he's ex- finishing the sentence yeah. He was saying in the classroom, and I'm like, what a great edit. Cutting from that one to the other, just transitioning seamlessly to that in the words are still going because it's like showing the classroom their conversation, showing something having to be built. And then as he's still talking on the plane, on the train. Yeah. There's a, it, yeah. it's a good cut. That's a good scene composition. Yeah. There was, uh yeah like i said i gotta i still got, i feel like i gotta digest it still um i feel like it works on multiple levels of analysis so i'd have to go back and look for it but like um yeah man i don't know all around i don't really what have... did you think of oppenheimer's hat because that was my main question as i was watching the movie is i wonder where scott ranks the hat um i thought that the i i don't know if that type of hat i don't know if that type of hat works for me that type of hat mm-hmm. is like pretty short on top yeah i like that i like like i like it on him mm-hmm. i just don't think that that is um i think i like the ones with a little bit bigger yeah for some reason or, i don't know why. brim yeah no not more brim more top up top okay you um, know what i mean like yeah. this is this is really short mm-hmm. um i don't know why i think that that crown that's the word more crown um his is really small, but I did like it. It was he had he had a nice hat. I did I do like that stuff. I thought his suspenders were a little bit dorky, but like <laughs> whatever. It was the 50, 40s. Everyone's suspenders were dorky. He seemed to be doing okay. Women seemed to like him, so I don't know. <laughs> okay, so that's one of those contradictions that I thought was amazing in the movie is that it shows that he's kind of naive and doesn't really get it a lot of times. Yet the moment he's in front of an attractive woman. There is no man on earth that's more charming than him. Yeah. And I just... You what? I love it because it... It feels real where there are these super rock star scientists, for lack of a better term, that have so little to offer outside of their field in most areas of life. Yet they have this weird charisma that just works for them. It made me think of Dr. Ian Malcolm in um, Jurassic Park. Yeah. Superstar, rock star scientist. Rock star scientist. Yeah. Do you have anything else you want to say about Oppenheimer? Yeah, it was a very, the the Oppenheimer thing was a very good clash between, um, I guess I talked to you before we started filming, but it was just because I just thought it was a good, it's a big difference between a good movie and a great movie. Yeah, even an okay movie like like yeah, I almost wanted to frame this as the juxtaposition between the two. You know what I mean? But um, that's the thing. Dial of Destiny is a mediocre film. Yeah, I enjoyed it, and I will still say it's a mediocre movie. I think that they did the 
think James Mangold did the best he could with what he had, which at the end of the day sucks. Whereas Christopher Nolan took an idea that he has loved and he, by sheer will, created this movie. And I think that this is the movie that he's been training to make. I think that all of his movies up to now, you can see things where he has figured out how to do the things. And this is the culmination of that. Yeah, like Indiana Jones, I watched the first 20 minutes and then I stopped and went to bed and I woke up the next morning and watched the rest. Mm -hmm. This one... You're gripped. Uh, I was gripped, but not only that, I would say I would even go as far as to say that I was inspired to like be a better artist slash person afterwards because of this movie. Like, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I need to get my shit together. Like, I need to like do uh, like that's like do that's the part that I should do that. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, that's the cool thing about it is that it makes you go, oh. I I want to do this. Yeah. Oof. Gotta get to that level, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Scott, do you have anything else you want to say? I was just good. It was a fun movie. Yeah. Uh fun to talk dial destiny someday. Maybe we'll watch an episode of uh the Indiana Jones Chronicles. It'll make us long for the good old days of the Crystal Skull. Scott, what have you got going on? Where can people find you? All the socials, all the thingies. All the makey things. Uh, YouTube, Scott Hebert Art, that's it. I'm on there uh, making paintings, and uh, that's about it. Still trying to figure it all out, but uh, yeah, slowly but surely just making paintings and uh, crushing them out. Awesome. Also, an observation I should make before we end the record button. We took more time to talk about this movie than this film had been in theaters, pretty much. W what do you mean? So it Dial of Destiny is going to start dropping theaters yeah like theaters are going to stop showing it I see what you're by saying. the time this episode goes out it may be out of theaters already that's funny anyway yeah uh, as far as a commercial thing it is um i guess that's one more thing to hit on uh, oh it lost uh, all, so much money 300 million to make we didn't even talk about that for how much it costs 300 million to make marketing is usually about double that and then the studio has to make you basically have to double that because this, the theaters and stuff take like half of it or whatever. So they're projecting they need to make like 700, 800 million to break even. And it's at, it's probably going to get like 300. Which maybe one of the largest flops in history, Disney history. Quite possibly. Like Crystal Skull isn't a great movie, but it made a lot of money. And I don't know how much of that was that it's a Spielberg film for one. You have the prestige. It also was the first one after so many years, whereas this one's coming off of all the negativity of the last movie. Yes. Anyway, Crazy. so that's Dial of Destiny. Uh, thanks for joining, Scott. Yeah, thanks for having me.